Holding an important place in cinema history, Cape Fear is the often forgotten but ever exciting 1991 Scorsese masterpiece, telling the tale of convicted rapist Max Cady, played by Robert De Niro, who enacts calculated revenge on his lawyer Sam Bowden for withholding evidence. Cape Fear sees him make Bowden and his wife and daughter suffer for his bungled trial. And who doesn't love some movie facts? Coming from one of cinema's best brains, Cape Fear is packed full of fun moments both on and off set. With that in mind, I'm Ash from What Culture, and these are 10 things you didn't know about Cape Fear. 10. De Niro underwent a full transformation for the role. Ever committed to his movie roles throughout the years, De Niro's stint as Max Cady saw him going to gym overload to get truly into the headspace of the creepy criminal, designing his body to better reflect the character's commitment to getting really freaking buff in the 14 years he was imprisoned. Spending five hours a day training once they started filming, it's clear that his unstoppable hashtag gym sesh paid off from the shots that made it to the film. Apparently, he got so pumped as KD that the tattoos the artist applied had to be increased in size by 10% over the course of shooting to make up for his giant mass. That's as well as paying a dentist $5,000 to grind down his teeth and $20,000 to fix them again. Do not test this man, he will gnash you! 9. There's more than meets the eye to De Niro's tattoos Whilst realistic and effective enough for the movie to create quite the impact, De Niro didn't actually go under the needle to get his biblical, vengeful, wobbly scribblings permanently etched onto his body. Instead, the whole getup was created using vegetable dye, lasting a few months rather than for the rest of his life. Selecting Bible verses to do with vengeance and redemption, De Niro and the artists for the movie got all holy on De Niro's bod, and created the giant cross laden with scales as representation of his weighted revenge plan throughout the film. Loretta, which is also scribbled on his chest, potentially is the name of an ex-fling, but it also doubles as standing for Sweet Bay Tree, which in turn stands for Honor and Victory. Looks like he was pretty confident from the outset of the film. 8. Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg traded scripts it's true that two great films were used as trading chips for a bit of fun between the directors, with the pair unhappy with their original choices and deciding to pull the old switcheroo between Cape Fear and, surprisingly, Schindler's List. One of Spielberg's most personal, affecting and harrowing films was almost completely different with another director at the helm. And the same can be said for Scorsese's violent remake movie. Scorsese was apparently worried about Schindler's List causing controversy after releases such as The Last Temptation of Christ in Goodfellas, deciding instead to go for the Cape Fear narrative detailing a rapist after a 15-year-old girl. 7. Ileana Douglas took inspiration from a real murder The woman who plays one of Cady's victims and Sam's work colleague, Lori, apparently took inspiration from the preppy killer and his real-life 18-year-old victim, Jennifer Levin, who was found strangled in Central Park after a stranger in a bar attacked her on their walk home. Douglas's scene where she utilised these emotions was a gruelling task, thrashing around for up to 17 hours at a time whilst handcuffed by De Niro. It took a solid two days of filming to get a hysteria exactly right but resulted in a compliment from De Niro himself for not being a pussy in her metal restraints. Well, that's something, I guess. 6. The original Cape Fear actors featured in the remake While Scorsese's version of the movie came out in 1991, there was already a successful predecessor that had made Cinematic Waves released in 1962. Itself based on John D. MacDonald's 1958 novel titled The Executioners, bringing back Robert Mitchum, who was Max Cady, and Gregory Peck, who played the first Sam Bowden, as well as Martin Balsam, who was originally the police chief, in Scorsese's version, their Lieutenant Elgar, Lawyer Lee Heller, and the Judge, respectively. 5. Cady's southern accent gave Scorsese the creeps Keeping his accent from a previous role, De Niro's choice for Cady's ominous southern drawl suited the role so much that Scorsese himself became concerned over the creepiness of the character, learning firsthand what a terrifying encounter with the criminal would be like. De Niro honed his accent choice by taking his script in one hand and a tape recorder in the other, then taking himself to the deep south of America to ask locals to read out his lines so he could record them and practice with genuine examples. After for all this effort, he used the voice to leave messages on Scorsese's answer machine whilst in character as Cady, just to freak him out a bit. 4. De Niro and Lewis improvised the kiss scene Being warned by the director that De Niro was going to improvise during their take of the uneasy kiss scene, Juliette Lewis didn't know what to expect when it came to capturing the seduction of her underage character. 
After sticking his thumb in her mouth a couple of times, Lewis got the gist, however, and expertly reacted to create a truly uncomfortable and affecting scene with De Niro. Setting up two cameras and letting them roll on each actor, the scene was only filmed three times total, and it was the first take that ended up making it into the movie. 3. Plenty of other actors wanted a slice of the pie The Cape Fear that could have been wasn't necessarily the one we got, with plenty of other eye-wateringly famous actors throwing their hat in the ring for varying roles. For the role of Juliet Lewis's Danielle, there was rivalry from both Drew Barrymore and Reese Witherspoon, with both completely ballsing up their auditions in front of the big-name filmmakers. Witherspoon couldn't hold herself together in front of De Niro, and Barrymore has proclaimed that Scorsese must think she's complete, and I quote, dog doo-doo for her presentation at the time. Whilst good old Bob was never contended in his casting choice as Katie by Scorsese, it was actually Bill Murray who was in consideration when Spielberg had his hands on the script. Somehow, I don't think it would be half as creepy with Garfield. 2. The score is made up of other recycled movie soundtracks As with any good thriller film, the score is one of the most important factors to get right to completely nail the dramatic tension on screen. It just wouldn't be the same if a brooding shot of a serial killer was accompanied by the wee lobby music now, would it? Created by composer Elmer Bernstein, he adapted the original movie's 1962 score into something slightly more modern, taking Bernard Herrmann's impeccable music sense and utilising it for his own. When he couldn't adapt something to his taste, Bernstein Bernstein took rejected pieces from Hitchcock's torn curtain and integrated them in too. He admitted himself that the five-time Oscar nominee would have absolutely hated the butchering of his work, but evidently didn't really mind. 1. Scorsese left a big plot clue in the opening sequence. The director introduces us to antagonist Max Cady in dramatic fashion, panning down over reams of religious paraphernalia before settling on his heavily tattooed back, practically pulsating as he works out before leaving his cell. Interestingly enough, on Katie's bookshelf, there's a novel titled The Cell Within by Jake Manning, which would seem pretty innocuous on its own. Digging deeper, however, attempting to find the book reveals it isn't a published work, but rather only exists within a Miami Vice storyline of the same name. Within the episode, Detective Tubbs is taken hostage and tortured by an ex-convict he previously put away. Sound familiar? The best part is that there's even a boat at the end. 